Hey guys, this is Adam LZ, and I'd like to welcome you guys to the first ever episode of my new podcast, The Scenic Route. My goal is to inspire by telling the unique stories of individuals I meet in the automotive industry, whether it's someone famous or someone that's killing it behind the scenes that you may have never heard of. It's never a clear cut path that they take, and it's more of, uh, I guess you could call it, a scenic route. This first podcast with Chelsea Denofa was actually recorded over a year ago, right after we had filmed the RTR video at the compound. I had no idea that I would wind up driving for RTR this year, and a lot of other things have changed since as well. I think it'll be interesting to hear some of our discussions now knowing that you guys can predict the future and everything that would end up happening. Now here I present to you our unedited podcast, and I hope you enjoy it. I fucking choked, dude. <laughs> Come on, bro. I believe in you. Okay, I could do this. I could do this. It's just, it's just Chelsea. And the million people watching. I know. Hold on. Oh, no, no. Oh, that's a good one. That's a little loud on there. Scary. God, dude. You're nervous. Th- we're setting the tone for this entire podcast, and now it's a fucking joke. All right. So <laughs> here's the premise behind this podcast. I don't have a name for it yet. This is super early. The idea behind it, I was on my Facebook page, and I saw a post of uh, one of my fans talking to other fans and other people in the car world, just asking kind of how to get their foot in the door. And it was really, really inspiring and inspiring. And man, I'm going to have to have it inspired you too. Yeah. Well, no, it was, it was very inspiring and it was cool to see all the people that uh, kind of open their eyes at like, Oh, Hey, I don't have to be a mechanic to work in the automotive field or I don't have to be a mechanical engineer and people sharing their stories of how they got into marketing and that's tied in with cars or photography or selling things. Um, and it was just very, very cool. And I saw probably half a dozen people have their lives changed just from opening their eyes to different ways to make a career out of cars. So my, my whole kind of driving factor behind this podcast is to bring individuals on that have very unique and cool stories of kind of how they made it. You know, it's going to be some people that might be influencers. There's going to be some people that may have a desk job working at a really cool automotive company and some people that do stuff behind the scenes that you may never know, but everyone's got a super unique story of like kind of how they got to where they are. And you, Chelsea, my first guest, welcome Chelsea Denofa. Thank you for having me. Um, it's, it's cool. I mean, I, I'm sure you're familiar with the story. I always tell everyone about how I got into drifting tied in with you, right? Yeah. I have heard it before. So it's very uh, touching this guy doing backwards entries at park and I didn't really give a shit about drifting. I guess this is going to be a swearing podcast. Yeah. Well, whatever. Yeah. We've decided that okay. now. <laughs> and I just saw that clip you do it in backwards entry and that was enough to push me over the edge. And, um, I know, I don't even know the first time we met. I think you like cool guide me at Oviedo skate park. Ooh. Yeah. No. I, I think so. That is when we met, though. Yeah, you had, like, glasses How did I on. I cool guy you? I'm I don't awful know. at riding bikes. Maybe we were just cool, and I was just, like, shy, so I was like, oh, this guy's too Taylor cool Taylor Ray brought me there, I think. No, oh. was it? Yeah, I think it was. Yeah. Well, anyway. Anyways. It's, it's we, a, it's we a small world. We rode BMX together yeah. before we drifted together. So, kind of where I want to start off with this is, you know, obviously a lot of people know your past with drifting. I feel like a good portion of my audience knows you now as this super successful, like, big name drift team, RTR, big name sponsors, and don't know the story of kind of what you did to get where you are, especially in the FD world. And um, in terms of bootstrapping or kind of, you know, doing it on a budget, I know you're one of the guys that comes to mind and every single person I've ever met has a crazy story about what you did to get where you are. And I'd love to hear some of them or have you talk about that experience. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I started drifting, I guess, in 2003. Actually, my first drift was in 2002. If my dad's listening to this, he doesn't know this, but I uh, crashed his nice Z3M trying to just drive it. I didn't know, and I started drifting and crashed it. <laughs> but I actually started drifting in 03. I was like 15. My mom used to drive the car to the track for me because I didn't have a license. And I drove a bunch of uh, just events that way, and like we didn't know what drifting was. We were just sliding around. We were all awful and all that. And I kind of worked at a diesel repair shop, and I was like fixing diesel trucks and selling cars and just finding ways to make a couple extra bucks here to go racing and drifting and all that. And uh, that kind of just escalated to me having just odd jobs all the time. Like I would work two or three months for a company and then decide, hey, I'm going to this place because I'm going to drift there for a while. And I would just go, crash on people's couches, work the job, and then go drifting on the weekends. And then I picked, I went all over the U.S. doing that, traveling with like a bunch of different series and I ended up in Texas and hooked up with Aaron Losey, which you know pretty well. Most of you guys probably do. And, uh, I mean, like we, I was running a whole drifting year for, like, $10,000. <laughs> and, and, you, and you're talking about FD or just no, no, in no, general? No, no, not FD, just in general. Okay. 
but like I was driving like 30, 40 weekends a, a year. Like I was, I had a tire sponsor at a time and I had some other things that were really important because I always focused like tires are the most expensive thing and then diesel. So I'd like buy and sell things and flip things on the internet and eBay and Craigslist and all that stuff to be able to get diesel and travel and do all that. And then I had tires and then like hopefully I would drive a competition or two and make some money. And if I didn't, I just got a job there working at somebody's shop or you know, wherever I was, I was like cleaning rail cars, like, like, uh, trains for a while. Like so <laughs> I, th I think a really good question. And I, I feel like where a lot of people miss the beat and I, I don't want to pause you cause I know you're, you're going on a good story here, no, but good. rewinding to the, the first job you had working at that diesel shop, I feel like a lot of people struggle with, you know, how do I just go and work at a shop? I don't know anything about cars. Like, do I have to go to, s people think they need to go to college or go to a trade school for, yeah, for four sure. years before they can get a job working in the field. So how did you wind up at your, in your first automotive job? Yeah, so my first automotive job is why I'm so successful today. It's wild. Like, you would never even think that. I bought a Miata off somebody at a dealership, and the, the sh dealership only sold Mustangs and Miatas at the time. That was it, which is actually kind of funny because now I'm in a Mustang. But, and my buddy, who became a really good friend of mine, Chip, owned the place. And I bought the car from him and, like, had a whole bunch of problems with it immediately. And I spent all my money on it. So I hit him up. I'm like, hey, like, can you, like, I'll fix it, but I just need someone to help me fix it. I don't know what I'm doing. Like, I could change tires or wheel or something, but, like, I had no idea. Like, maybe change spark plugs, you know. And he helped me through that, and I was washing tr cars for him and stuff. And then he got in the diesel market, started working on diesel trucks, and I just started, like, I just hung around the shop and just started doing stuff. And he would pay me in, like, knowledge and being able to, you know, take parts from his race cars and stuff when he was u when they were used and all that. And just kind of, like like an internship mm -hmm. almost, right? And then I started working on diesel stuff. He started paying me. And then it was like, he was super into racing. So I was like kind of going around and helping him in between all of my other stuff. So that job, like just going there and going back, it just created this relationship. And I saw an opportunity and he saw an opportunity because I was 15 or 16 and cheap labor and like had was really hungry to succeed. So it was just kind of worked out that way. And I, I was in and out of that place working there for like two or three years. And we're still super good friends now. But, like, him being into racing really kind of got me, like, I was just a BMX skate park rat, skateboarder, all that stuff. Like, I was started drifting, and I'm like, this is one of the coolest things ever. It's, like, the natural evolution of my, my attitude and driving and stuff. And that's one thing that we've always had in common. I feel like that's probably why I was following you at the time, because you were one of the drifters that was also doing BMX stuff, and I thought that was cool. Um, so w would you say based off kind of your story to someone that wants to get their foot in the door? I mean, people always ask me like they want to get involved in FD and they want to work in an FD team because it looks like this glorious thing. You and I know it's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of work, but I, I would usually suggest kind of what your story was that like, you know, either get an internship, work for someone for free or like honestly being in the right place at the right time and surrounding yourself with a shop that you want to be at, just offering the help and absorbing. Don't, yep. don't come into it thinking you need to know everything or thinking that you already know everything. Yeah. I mean, I 100% I agree with that. I mean, I, I wouldn't say I was, like, a do bitch for mm -hmm. him or anything, but, like, he saw that I was hungry for it, and, but I knew nothing. So it was a good value exchange, you know. And uh, being around the right people is the most important thing. I don't know if it's even so much the right place, right time. Mm -hmm. For me, it's always been being around the right people that you believe in and they also believe in you because then together you grow. I agree. And I think also, too, like, when it – when, when you are someone that has knowledge or skill, like it's exciting to share that with someone, especially someone that's eager to learn. For sure. So it's, it's way more fun to teach someone that wants to know something than to teach someone that like doesn't want to know it. A hundred percent. Oh yeah. I mean, I teach for a living basically. Yeah. And like I, there's people that come to my school and they're like eager to learn and they're listening and maybe they're not applying it right away because they don't understand it. But mm -hmm. you know, you just break the, down those barriers and you see them paying attention to you and you see them trying something new every time. Then I have people that show up and they just want to be there and burn tires off and have no idea what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> and they don't want to learn and they just absorb nothing, you know. Teaching's fun, man. Like I love it. That's that's one of my, my biggest passions in BMX. And that's initially how I had my success was just that once you get to a certain point, it's so much harder to continue progressing yourself that you can start to get the same satisfaction of seeing other people For sure. succeed. And I learn things all the time from teaching people too yep. and make myself better. So it's, yeah, it's, it's a, I love teaching. One of my favorite things for sure. I definitely want to talk to you uh, a little bit about the drift school, but I want to continue kind of talking about your FD journey. So you're, you're doing these $10,000 a year <laughs> budgets, drifting, got a tire sponsor, flipping stuff, and then kind of bring me through the progression to formula drift. Yeah. So, um, in Oh six, I drove D one GP in New Jersey. That was my first like huge event. 
um, and all the guys from Japan were there, and like that's people I had looked up. We were downloading videos on LimeWire and Napster and stuff, watching them Lime drift. Wire. Yeah, like it's you don't even, like most of the people listening don't even know that like what that is. But uh, so I went to that event and it was like eye opener. I was like, oh man, this is not just about like skidding around doing donuts and like being good at drifting the bank. You know, it's like this is these people are this is for real. This is a job. Like these people are ripping. They're having a good time. They have all these partners, all these sponsors. Somebody flew them over from Japan with their cars, like all that stuff. I'm like, this is going to be for real. And I remember just being like, this is it. Like, I think it's early enough in America to chase this dream. But again, like I was making no money. Mm -hmm. Like at that point, my job was 15 or $20,000 a year, you know, and I made another, maybe that flipping stuff. But like that was using all that to go drifting. I was like staying on couches, like we were saying. And after that event, there was a series called Nopi Drift. And I traveled around. I had a Miata at the time. And I drove all of the Nopi events. We went and bought, like, a crappy three-car trailer. And we had an old Chevy Dually. Like, piece of crap. And we had some friends. We just got together. And we just went everywhere. And we just decided events. We pulled all of our money together. We all stayed in the same hotel rooms. It reminded me of BMX back in the day. Mm -hmm. It was like, how do we make this as cheap as possible? And I felt like we were driving around doing Road Fools thing, yeah. you know? And we would you know, be going somewhere and we'd hit up these fairs and these events and monster jam and all that and be like, yo, we want to drift in your parking lot. Like during this, we don't even have to pay us. Like we just want to like do it. So we'd go and drive demos and all sorts of stuff. Right. That's so just thing. trying to put a name out like a week before their carnival or whatever, we'd just go and shred, you know? So we drove Nopi. I did okay. And there was some formula D guys driving in that at the time. And I had never been to a formula D event in my life. I never even watched it. I was like, I'm not even going to go and figure it out. I'm like, I'm just going to get really, really good. And when I have the money, I'm going to go drive it. So I drove that, Nopi. I drove XDC um, up until 2011. And I moved to Florida and started working at BC Racing, like, full-time. That was, like, my first real full-time job, like, office job, whole nine. So Pete at BC, like, super, like, believed in me a ton. And he's like, yo, like, you're really good. You've won XDC back-to-back -back champion. Like, we need to get to FD. And I'm like, yeah, but, like, FD costs like $50,000. Like we can't go drive FD. It's so much money. Like I wasn't defeated, mm -hmm. but I knew like I had to like work more to be able to do it. You know, I had some sponsors, some partners, a little bit of budget here and there, but it was like, I could drive XDC. I can win some money. I can make some money off some sponsorships and I can keep doing that, you know, because FD is so expensive that I'm going to run myself into the ground. Mm -hmm. So I kept doing it and I kept getting Formula D licenses. I got my first one in like 09. Then I got another one in 10 and then 12. Or 11, I mean. Um, and I was like, okay. Pete's like, we're going to go drive FD. I'm like, no way. Like, this is not going to happen. Like, Al, how are we going to do this? He's like, we're going to buy a truck and trailer, and we're going to go drive every round, and we're going to figure it out as we go. And I'm like, all right. Like, sweet. Are you sure? And, like, for the next week, I was like, are we for real going to do this? Like, I don't know, man. Like, I think I'm ready to drive, like, driving-wise, but I don't know what I'm doing. And we bought a tow home, and, like, the whole nine went full, full bore. You know, and uh, is that the one that's still? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that thing was super nice back in the day. I bet until the roof blew off, we fixed that. And, you know, life goes on. Yeah, there th it's sitting in an undisclosed location, it's but it's it's sad actually. It really is. Like imagine like that was my break into FD, and it was such a nice toter home. Like, and we were one of the first people to show up with a toter home. It was like, dang, that's sick. You know, mm. like, but we were hauling Matt Field and Jeff Abbott and like other drivers to help pay for the cost and all that stuff. But um, yeah, and like made it into FD. And I think our first season we spent like we went ten thousand dollars over budget, like sixty thousand. But I was like crunching every number, like trying to figure out the best ways to do it. And then in thirteen, when I ran like basically my own program, and Pat and Pat Gooden and I got together and split costs, and you know we did the same thing. I think I didn't even like pay for a hotel for me and my crew till like twenty fifteen. We went like four years of just crashing on couches and sleeping in trucks and doing everything we can to like make it happen and blowing motors and not having money to fix it and going to junkyard like while we're on the road pulling motors out like just chasing it like mm -hmm. trying to do everything we could to like stay in it because we were like oh if we miss a round like our career's over mm -hmm. and i'm like look at it now I'm like you should just missed a couple rounds dude because you blew it damn there's a there's a, a way station story that cody was telling me i don't know if you know which one i'm talking about <laughs> there's a few of those okay maybe we shouldn't talk about no, that you can. That's okay fine. well i'm gonna let you tell the story he was telling me about one with tires that i was oh I yeah was yakking oh, yeah. up in the office laughing uh, yeah so we were driving home from an xdc event in jersey and we're going to like i think it was tennessee or something and we had our, our rig was underweight like we always weighed like we're like oh it's like 25 990 and for most of you guys that don't know like 
as soon as you surpass 26,000 pounds and you need a CDL and you need all this stuff, like when you're in a truck and trailer. And uh, we had this like super ghetto three car hauler with all of our cars on it, like open trailer. All of the cars are stickered up, all of the everything. Like, so we're, we're like, okay, we're just cruising through. And all of a sudden we pass the way station and we used to have this switch on our trailer that would turn the lights off on the trailer. Mm-hmm. So it just looked like we were a truck at night, like driving by. <laughs> <laughs> so we drive by. And then as soon as we ba- drive by, flip the lights back on. We're just cruising, and all of a sudden, a cop pulls up behind us. And we had just fueled, and we used to carry, like, a 150-gallon tank in the bed of the truck because it was cheap. We'd fill up. We'd use, like, an app to get the cheapest, like, mm-hmm. diesel, you know. And we had a friend in the back, and we had so many extra tires because a couple of the people that were with us, like, didn't get enough laps. So we had all these new tires, like, with, like, a 40-foot ratchet strap in the wedge trailer. Like, so much extra weight. And the cops like, all right, I'm take your driver's license, and you got to go back to the way station. I'll meet you back there. I'm like, okay. So we pull up, get to the next exit, turn around. My friend Will Parsons is in the back. I'm like, you got to get out, dude. <laughs> like we we are overweight. Like and the human, like you just yes, wanted him to just we, get out. Well, he was laying down in the back, and the cop didn't see him. Ah, uh, okay, okay. So I'm like, you got to get out. And like we parked, and we were throwing wheels off the trailer <laughs> down a hill. Like, just off into the oblivion, because we, we knew that cop was waiting for us, and we didn't have any extra time, so we're throwing wheels, undo the strap. Did you know that you were overweight, or did you Oh, just we were overweight. Okay. Because um, we just took on, like, a 1,000 pounds of fuel, like, yeah. you know, and I knew we were super close, so I'm like, we're over right now. And we made a joke, we're like, oh, we get pulled over when we're the heaviest we've ever been, and we did. So we're, like, 40 tires off into the ditch, like, uh, we had a whole bunch of crap. We did you throwing. go back and get them, or no? Yeah, yeah we did. Oh, okay, okay. So, and then we leave Will with them. <laughs> like, Will, you got to stay here, dude. Like, sorry, man. Like, we're, we're screwed. He's like, no, I get it. Totally. We're so screwed. Like, we're going to be so screwed. So we pull back. And, and the fines are huge. Huge. $10,000. Easily. Easily. So I'm like, pull back onto the scales. And I'm like, I don't know if we dropped enough. Like, what are we going to do? Like, this and that. And we pull onto the scales. And we're like 25, 9, 60 or something. Like, 50 pounds under. And we're like, thank God, you know. And then the cop's like, oh, well, like, we got to check your stickers on your truck and trailer. And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, oh, your sticker for your truck is 14000 and the sticker for your trailer is 15000 So you're at 28000 I'm like, but we're underweight. Like, just play stupid. Mm-hmm. Like, we knew what the deal was. And he's like, no, you're overweight. This is it. You need a logbook. You need a health insurance card. You need all the air, like, not air brakes, but, like, all these endorsements. Like, you don't have IFTA. You're not paying taxes. You're not doing this. He's like, you better pull over there. So we pull over and he searches our truck trying to find something on us, like showing that we're a business. Because when they're asking, like, I'm like, yo, we just race cars for fun. And they're like, what about all these stickers on your car? I'm like, don't they look sweet? <laughs> you know, like, those are pretty rad. He's like, no, nah, those are your sponsors. I'm like, no, we paid for all that. Like, we just do this for fun. And the kid's like, the guy's like, where do you get money for this? I'm like, oh, my parents just give me money because I do good <laughs> in school. Right? And they're like, you don't win any money or trophies? And I'm like, No. And Aaron Losey's uh, S13 was on the back, and they had a check in the back of it oh my for $5,000, like, in the hatch, like, uh, right hilarious. through the window, you could see it. He's like, oh, what's this? And we're like, clearly you can't cash that. It's a six-foot check. <laughs> like, it's not real. It's a vanity check. And the cop's like, come on, bro. So he goes back, brings us in the office, and he Googles our name, and, like, the first photos that show up are, like, recently us winning events. We're, like, all on the podium with oh trophies in our hands and all this stuff. And I'm like... Oh my god, we're so screwed. Damn, he did his due diligence. Yeah, huh? oh, he was hungry, and uh, we got like twelve and a half thousand dollars for the fines. Oh, you did? Yep. Well, see, when I was told this story, it was told like a like a. Like I got a completely different story that you guys were like throwing tires off b- before a way station made it through, and it was fine. I didn't know you guys no, actually no, got we fined. Got screwed, and like uh, we had to fly in our friend Tyler, which is rest in peace. But we flew him in. Because he had a CDL mm-hmm. to drive. We had to fly him in. like, And then he got a car and drove to us and had to drive it off the lot. And then as soon as he drove off the lot, we just switched back and started driving again. Because there was like, what are we going to do? We're not going to make him drive all the way back. And it sounds ridiculous, but I've actually heard that same story from a number of different FD teams that and are running. This run is into not the only time. <laughs> no, I know, but like I've heard probably a, a dozen stories from yeah. different people that have all had similar things happen and had to fly out someone with a CDL. Yeah, it's a mess. That's crazy. The Toter home gets away with everything because it's got it's an RV, yeah. even though it's like eighty thousand pounds. Like that's w- a wacky rule. It is a wacky and people rule. People don't get it on YouTube, but like technically, because it has a bathroom and what like living quarters, it's yep. a RV. And yep. Well, I'm I'm like we actually have a CDL driver right. driving, which is cool now. Um, but you, you, our buddy Jim, yeah. he's awesome. That's cool. 
Yeah, I've definitely had some problems. I've even had, like, just with a truck and trailer, like, not even a big deal, just me and single car get pulled over because I have trophies and stuff, like, especially Arizona and stuff's, like, really tough. But, yeah, there's some struggles out there for sure. So, rewinding, I guess, kind of, like, I don't I don't know when it is necessary that I met you in your FD timeline, but I can vividly remember, I think it was outside John and Keegan's shop. We were all sitting around, like, a little fire talking, and you were telling one of your stories about how you bolt check your car <laughs> and I was this, I was this kid in an S13 and you were talking about how like this bolt, you, you had like some like system of measurements in, I don't remember if they're Ugga Duggas or something You're like this bolt's a three, this bolt's a two. And I have my guy do this. And I was listening like, this guy's fucking crazy. Like now, you just, now you just, I'm not so crazy. Am no, I? but I, I was li- listening to you. I was like, man, you just drift a car. I like street drove my car there from probably yeah. like an hour away. And I was like, what is this guy going on about? Is he like a worry wart? But now like I, I get it. I understand. Yeah. And I mean, um, like, we don't nut and bolt our cars every time we drive them. But, like, in an FD car, oh, dude, like... everything comes loose. Yeah, it's gnarly. I mean, I, I kind of learned my lesson with my I had my R32 that was, like, an all heim joint car up in the Northeast. Oh, yeah. Every day I would have to nut and bolt the car, which sounds ridiculous. But So what, what I'm curious and what I'm getting at is kind of that level of organization and having to create a system for nutting and bolting your car. Like, would you consider yourself an organized person or a systematic person, or is it literally just with that? Uh, it's just with motorsports. Yeah. I mean, like, I have a care to be organized with everything, but also there's not enough time to be organized with everything, at least for me. And being that I travel all the time and I'm doing it, I have my own, like, organizational system, but it's not, like, foolproof. I mean, it's pretty, pretty like, uh, dodgy, mm. <laughs> you know? I feel like I live in a pinball machine sometimes. I mean, I, I kind of feel the same exact yeah, way. Like I'm putting out fires that aren't even anything to do with me half the time. Yeah. <laughs> so... Kind of going around that then, if you're not super organized, do you find yourself delegating to other people that organize or kind of, would you consider yourself good at delegating, not good at delegating? I think I'm getting better at it. I think because I did everything on my own for so long, it's hard for me to like, I don't want to use the term let go because I have no problem Relinquish with letting control. somebody. But yes, that's exactly right. Yep. Um, but like my wife, Chelsea, helps me out, keeping me like on check from where I need to be. And I have things and like in motorsports world, I think I'm fairly organized, but Outside of that is, well, there's not much outside of that to be honest with you. Yeah, it's mostly just motor, like motorsports. And you gotta, you gotta live, eat, and breathe the stuff that we do to be to successful. Make it. Yeah, hundred percent. Like, I think that's all I did. Mm-hmm. You know, like was that like everything that I did was a variation of a thought process to be better at the next step thing in that. You know, it's like everything you think about, you're like, oh, like. I need to eat a little bit cheaper for the next couple of weeks so I can go racing there or, or maybe even the opposite way. Like I need to not spend money on things that distract me from what's important. You know, it's like, it's a, it's a balance of it all. So with that being said, was it hard to go from kind of running your own bootstrapped program into like what I consider probably one of the highest tier teams in FD? I was so ready to give up on that. Oh yeah. I was like, here's everything. Like I just want to drive and like, I definitely had a problem with not being able to have every aspect of it in my hands all the time, but it was also really cool because they were like, look, like we're going to do this and we're going to do this exactly how we normally do this. And then we're going to see how you work into that. Right. So it didn't get really give me a choice on changing a lot of things like the car and the program and all that. And I just, you know, I trusted RTR and everything they had going on. Um, and just basically trust the process you know, and we did a year of that, like where I just didn't really, obviously I had tons of setup tricks and things that I've been chasing forever. Like we won FD event with very little for, you know, quite a little while. And, uh, I'm like, RTR is one of the most successful teams. Like, I'm just going to trust it. And I told myself, just, just trust the process. And I did, and it worked out great. And then there were some things I felt like there was improvement in because I had came from a different background and we improved from there. And, but it's like, for me, and this is going to sound crazy, but like when I go to FD, it's like a vacation for me because I show like during the week, normal stuff in between events, I'm like managing everything. Mm-hmm. I'm working on most of the stuff. I'm putting out fires. I'm doing this a million phone calls, million emails. But on FD weekends, everyone knows I'm busy. Yeah. So no one really bothers me. And then at the track, my team handles everything so well that I don't really have to work my brain on anything besides focusing on drifting, which is a lot, but it's way less than like my normal life. <laughs> it's it's funny because I, I feel a very similar way. And I'm, I'm super thankful that I kind of had the benefit of being surrounded by such good people on my own internal team that mm-hmm. they've 
been able to almost essentially create a turnkey program for myself. So I kind of get to have the best of both worlds in the sense that I kind of have control. Yeah. But at the same time, like I, I feel the same way. It's vacation. Like people bring me food and stuff. Yeah, when, like, I know. I, I feel so guilty the whole anything? time. And yeah. Like, I'm like, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you though. But no, I, I can definitely relate to that. So, um, yeah, it's kind of interesting though. Like going to something that's probably the most stressful thing, but it, now it's like, because you have such a good team, because you surround yourself by all the right people, like I was mm-hmm. saying, and because you know how to follow your dream and keep it on track and everybody shares that vision, it just works. It's amazing. Yeah. But I do feel like that way in the two now. The team and everybody takes a lot of, um, they take feedback from me and improve mm-hmm. the car a lot and the team and all that. But I'm also still like every lap I take, everybody's learning and progressing. And the sport is one of those things where it's not like, oh, we went a quarter second faster because we're drag racing sick we're all so pumped like let's get the next quarter second it's like this sport is not just a timed thing yeah (laughs) it is so many variables it's so dynamic and i I feel like that's kind of one of the rewarding things and like us for sure us as a team being a new team the learning curve for us is huge so we're learning a ton and it's it's exciting it's a lot of work and you know every round we feel a lot better but yeah i mean i think that goes to show even the, the highest level tier team in ft like still learning everybody's learning yeah no for sure i mean like just watching you come through the ranks at fd and stuff and and being absorb absorbing so much right because everybody wants to help you because like that's how drifting is right Mm -hmm. but you kind of came in good car good program good team but like everybody was like about 80 percent you know like i'm not trying to diss it at all 80 percent was really good coming into fd Mm -hmm. i was like 60 until i drove with rtr like running my own program but like now it's like you see really quickly how fast that other 10 or 15 percent came up you know where it's like now you're ripping little things here and there your team knows what you like driving wise Mm -hmm. now when you cars doing something that you don't like there's a way to fix it there's a process and you can see like the improvement each day driving you know so it's pretty sick like i'm pretty pumped to watch you drive we got one more time last year bro i know it was was Dude, crazy man! <laughs> if you wouldn't have blown off track, it would have been another one more time. Dude, I was just you know I didn't want to smoke, dude. I didn't want to hit the Mustang, so I lifted, dude. <laughs> like you yeah. know, I hit that thing and I just like disintegrate, man. Well, yeah. So I didn't even know you went off, and I like, oh damn, he finished because you drove right back on and was behind me again. Yeah. And I was like, damn, here we go one more time again. And then I watched on the board, like, damn, he went again. He should have went again. Texas was awesome. That was that. I'd felt great in the car. I yeah. felt like I got the layout, and it's it's crazy, man. Like. I always, like, day one, I'm like, what am I doing here? I have no <laughs> idea. I can't make a lap. I'm not going to qualify, even though there's no qualifying. Right. Like, I feel so terrible. And then the next day, I, like, feel pretty bad in the morning. And then come competition time, I'm like, all right, I got this. Yeah. Every single night before the round, like, after practice, I'm just like, what am I doing in FD? <laughs> Same thing at Clutch Kickers, man. Like, nah, all, you all, deserve to be there, though, man. No, but, like, my mindset after practice, I always feel just terrible i think i overthink things and yeah i just watch some footage and i'm like oh like i think it was seattle just driving in the bank so i it don't took know me forever to figure out just not to floor it oh yeah 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 i would just keep flooring driving down yeah. the bank <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah i mean that's like a that's the deal for sure yeah but like so you might have the same problem that i have like i psych myself out because i drive so many different cars all the time mm-hmm. like i never like i only drive my fd car basically at FD rounds, besides like a test in the beginning of the year. So every time I get in it, I'm like, oh man, like here we go. Cause I come from like lower power cars mm-hmm. and like more big heavy cars, like the you know, spec 5D we do demos with is like stock basically, just has angle and a little bit more power. And then they're like, these are like a totally different machine, right? So every time I get in it and I'm driving, I'm like, just get into the first turn and you'll figure it out. Like to me, that's like one of the most th- important things. Vaughn actually told me that. He's like, man, like if you're ever doubting yourself, just like know you're good at it and know it's going to work because it's worked every other time. Just get into the first turn. And like that's the first practice run. I'm like, okay, just get in the first turn. (laughs) Like it's going to work. I think what's tough for me is like I've always through BMX, I was never a person to just send it or huck it down a set of stairs. I always would work myself up to it. Yeah. So uh, the same thing with drifting for me, I can never just go balls to the wall in my first lap. Like I have to do a bad lap to then do a little bit better lap to then Mm. do a little bit better. And in FD, that's difficult because you get so few practice laps that you almost can't do that. And you have to kind of have a plan and go all in your first lap. Cause if you don't, it could be a whole waste of practice. Yeah. I think like, so my move and I don't mean it's everybody does something different, but my move is always like 
just over handbrake the first lap. Like, still drive it hard, but, like, mm-hmm. just buy yourself a lot of time to pick up your marks and do all that. That way you're still where you need to be, and the line is good. Yeah. It doesn't really matter what happens in between that. It's more of just getting the line, and then you can start smoothing that out and handbrake less and power more and more angle and all that stuff. Like, But I still probably just send it as fast as I can go first lap, I feel like. <laughs> I feel like I rode BMX the same way, though. Like, I just laughed. Ah, screw it. I've done a 360 so many times, you just do a 360 off of it. Well, 360 is one thing. So. Yeah. Well, well drifting will get that way, though. No, I know, I know, More, I know. I mean, dude, how long have you been driving? Five years? Four years? Uh, I think it started. It's like six years, probably. Yeah. yeah. I mean, dude, there's not many people in six years that are riffing as hard as you. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it. And this podcast has turned into Chelsea giving me drift tips, which I really appreciate. Oh, my but God. No. My, I told you I'm a teacher, bro. <laughs> uh, no, I, I appreciate it. But one, one thing that I wanted to touch on that I know... Um, you've done a lot and I don't know for how many years you've been doing it, but flipping cars, man, I feel like that's a very good intro for a lot of people into kind of getting in the automotive world. Um, whether it be buying and selling Miatas, lawnmowers, <laughs> like, and I guess lawnmowers, not automotive, but no, buy, still fixing buying stuff. and selling, buying and selling yep. is a very common thing I see with people that kind of get their foot in the door. And I'm curious, kind of your experience with it, what you've learned, where that took you and the business side of things. Yeah, so obviously, like I was saying, my first job was basically cleaning and getting cars prepped to be sold and whatnot. And throughout my life, I probably owned an embarrassing amount of cars, like hundreds, and not hundreds right. yeah. yeah, I mean, but th- like five hundred dollar cars, thousand dollar cars, like not nothing like crazy. Um, and I've always just been able to recycle cars, meaning like buy low, sell high, and like make it nice and sell something that I would be proud to drive every day. And I feel like most people don't do that. They sell cars when they're done with them. Mm-hmm. Like, they're like, ah, oh, there's too many problems. Like, it's time to move on to something else. But, like, I was buying those cars, fixing them, cleaning them up. I still do it now. And, I mean, it's good, like, a little bit of money here and there. And it's, you know, simple cash deals. You got to deal with a lot of people. But I think as a whole, it like, as long as you're selling good cars, I think it makes it so, hey, I have a focus. I have to fix this car. I have to get it to the point where it's ready to be sold. I have to drive it for a little while, which is nice because you get to enjoy it. And like, I enjoy driving everything I drive, but even if it's a piece of crap, like it's got some quirks and emotion to it. And then selling it and writing a good ad and like being, you know, re- researching the market and selling it for what it needs to be sold for. Um, so that's kind of what I've been doing like on the side with stuff because like people now, like I, I people just contact me. They're like, hey, do you want to buy my car? Like it has this problem, this and that. E36 or Mustang or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, sure. Cause I've fixed so many of them. Like most of it's a quick fix and I probably have the parts sitting in my shelf, mm-hmm. you know? So it's like recycling stuff and getting them going again, saving some cars, you know, playing the car market where you buy a couple and you kind of wait a little bit cause you know, it's going up or, you know, my big thing is like with the E36 market was like, I had tried to make that the coolest drift car ever. Cause I felt like it was the best one for the money. And I've always been like, these are great drift cars. So, like, when someone buys a car from me, they know it's set up, it's ready to go, especially if I'm selling a drift car. Like, it's just going to be turnkey ripper, you mm-hmm. know? But, yeah, like we were saying, it is a way for people to step in because it allows you to set a timeline, fix a car, you know, get it running, enjoy it, and then make some profit off of it. And that's how I always treated it. I always try to enjoy every car that I buy to sell. And that way, too, if you sell it and break even, at least you got free enjoyment. For sure. And that's, like, the biggest thing, mm-hmm. like, I have some cars. I'm like, ah, this is kind of expensive. Like, maybe we won't make any money on it. But then I just say, oh, I'll just keep it for three or four months and enjoy it. And then I can move on. And then I know if I want another one later, I know what it's like, you know. And I feel like the knowledge that you gain along the way, too, that could, you know, get you a job working on a particular car like sure. that or something sure. of that regards. Um, so kind of from there, uh, obviously, that I'm, I know is still going on now. You've done FD. Um you sold stuff on Amazon? Yeah, I do a lot of e-com stuff, like some Amazon stuff. And business mogul over here. Well, I just try to, like, diversify in everything, dude. Smart. I mean, Especially in today's times. Yeah, I feel, like, I feel like the more you're educated in, you can really focus on what you enjoy. Like, for me, it's like a lot of people are into buying real estate and doing house stuff and, like, all that. And, like, my wife wants to buy some real estate and stuff. And I'm like... In Florida, please. Yeah, she, <laughs> she, wants, she wants us to move back to Florida, but... It's like, that's not my thing. I don't enjoy it. Like, I'm not, that's not it. Like, to me, it's like, okay, I, like, we've done some stuff, you know, and, like, rental property stuff, and I'm like, yeah, it's just like, eh, I don't enjoy it. Like, and if I don't enjoy it, like, even if it paid more than something else, it's like, I'd rather do what I enjoy. Like, it's not like I'm being picky about the money, like, whatever. Like, 
I am like we have to make a living somehow, right? Well, once you like diversify into so many things, you can really just decide what works best and you enjoy most, whether it's more profitable or not. I think that's a, a huge point that you hit on the head there. Kind of what we were saying about motorsports can be applied into any career that like sure. you need to love what you're doing because if you want to be more successful than everyone else, you need to be working twice as much. You yeah, need to be okay sure. pulling late nights and you need to be super passionate about what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I totally agree with that. And that's kind of my thing is like, I probably work three or four times as hard as someone else per dollar, mm-hmm. you know, but it's like, I enjoy every bit of it. So it's not like, it's like less work, you yep. know, and it's more enjoyable. And then even like we were talking about selling cars, like I get to, like, I see people, I'm like, yeah, just make sure you like tag me on Instagram when you talk about like your car or whatever. So I can see what's going on with it. Cause I've given someone a tool to go enjoy and maybe start the next step of what they're doing, you know? Have you ever had like that backfire on you, like sold someone a car that turned out to be a bad car. And then like, even if you're willing to work with that person, just, they just want to be a Karen about it and just be annoying. I haven't had a single car that I've sold that has been like that, except to a friend. (laughs) So my guy who works for me now, Kelly, who, you know, Mm -hmm. I sold him an E46 and I probably put four or 500 miles on it driving around. He's like, Oh, I want to buy that. It's like a car I can kick back and forth. Like whatever. I'm like, okay, sure. No problem. And I sold it to him. It's been a disaster. And I'm like, God, I feel so bad. I'm like, I'm like, but I gave you, I like when I sold it to him, I'm like, I'm going to give you such a good deal that if anything <laughs> happens, that's the key. Like, it's like, I don't have to deal with it. Yep. You know? And I'm like, I'll help you like however we need to, but I just don't, I don't want to stress about selling you something. And then like, I bought a, a Zuzu NPR, like cab over truck flatbed from one of my friends. And it's been like the biggest disaster ever. <laughs> and damn. I'm like, every time I buy something or sell something to a friend, I feel like, and it's no one's fault. Like, it's just how the, the cookie crumbles kind of thing. But, yeah, I've never had a, like, customer-type deal that I've sold a car and had backfire. I really try to, like, make sure they're vetted before they leave. And That's I also, awesome. I think a lot of them understand, too, like, sometimes they're buying 25-year-old cars. Like, if I sell it to them and a 1,000 miles later the water pump goes, like, eh, it's not really my fault. That's a, that's a good point. Yeah. Kelly's an awesome dude. I uh, I met him at Ebisu forever ago, and... I, I didn't even connect the dots when he started working for you. And then I, I like put everything together and I was like, dang, that's sick. So yeah. That's another thing, surrounding yourself with the right people. Like, I mean, there, I was trying to hire somebody to be a mechanic and help me out with stuff and really just be like someone that can take the load off of me, you know? But like that person has to be good. Mm-hmm. They, like not even the fact that they have to be good at their job. Like they have to be a good person and genuinely like give a shit. Oh yeah. <laughs> and like, that's hard to find. And like, you have to have a vibe with someone where like, you know, you can talk to them like how you would talk to somebody, whether they're an employee or a friend, and they know that like it's all for the common good to like make something that's great, you know? Yeah. The the wrong person will suck the energy out yep. of everyone. I know. Even if they're good at their job, they'll just suck you down. You know what's you know what's crazy? Um I don't I mean I'm sure you know this because obviously he talked to you about it, but I found out not too long ago that Johan, who works for me now and is like amazing dude, super talented, applied to work for you at the drift school. Yeah, for sure. That's crazy. Yeah, it was one of those things, like, he hit me up, and we were talking, and I'm like, hey, man, like, it's not, this is not a rich and money job for you, Mm -hmm. like, but it's rich in, like, experience and lots of driving, and you don't even have to own a drift car. You can drive two or three days a week, you know, like, so you got to have value in that, but he's got family and stuff, and, like. For sure. That was, it was a a tough thing. But But I think it would have been, I mean, obviously, he's working out well for you. Yeah. I think Stolen also from me, bro. Why'd you do that? <laughs> <laughs> no, but like, you know, in your, in your current scenario, like I know it's not the highest paying job in the world, but getting to drive park and all that experience and like, it will go such a long way. If I don't, I don't want to like, you know, like kick Kelly to another no, job, no, no, but no, like sure. if he were to go and uh, apply for another job, it says loads that he worked with you and worked closely with you worked at the drift school, you know, has a lot of experience with all these E36s that, you know, that experience is more valuable than if he made an extra 10 grand a year. Yeah, for sure. And like, I even kind of pitch it as like, look, like you guys that are driving, you know, 15 events a year, just because you want to go drift and have fun, like that costs you 15 grand minimum. Yep. I'm like, now you don't have to pay for any of that. Like people who work for me, like just go thrash our cars all the time and have fun. Cause that's like, they're literally working on them, instructing students in them all that stuff. So like they need to be able to be good in the cars. Like it's a, I'm, I want them to go drive and be better, you know? So, uh, I know you have some other instructors that come on. Is Kelly the only like really full-time person at the school kind of servicing cars? Yeah. It's, uh, it's the two of us doing it. He handles most of the like 
day to day maintenance and all mm-hmm. that, and then I'll jump in if something needs to be done. That's you know either a two man job or need some chassis set up or something like that. And then we have Travis Reader who comes out, another FD driver, and does instruction on days where we have a lot of people. Um, and then just me, pretty much. Um, we have some things where we want to do some guest instructors and whatnot. Um, it's just been with all the crazy world stuff going on, it's been a little bit lighter than normal, but everything's going well, you know. So uh, Chelsea or Chelsea, <laughs> as some people call her, um, yep. your significant other. Uh, congrats, by the way. Thanks, appreciate yep. it. Yep. Um, you guys are married now, correct? Yeah. Okay. We are. I didn't want to say propose when. No, it's been it. We've been married for a year. We got married basically right before uh, the whole COVID thing. Well, I remember going with you guys to the donut place in Texas when you guys were picking out the, the donuts for. Oh the yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we had uh, voodoo donuts at our wedding, so it was like we were all trying them out. And we were like, Adam, eat these donuts. <laughs> Tell them if they're good. You're like, I've eaten so many donuts. <laughs> Well, I you do like donuts. I always get nervous when I don't know if like someone, someone's like girlfriend or like their fiance or wife. So I'm just like their, their girl, their significant. <laughs> other. I did that to you earlier in the video. I was like, and this is Chelsea's girl boo thing. <laughs> God. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So That's she, good. she you rode in quite the back of the TI to get there, dude. Drifting up the on ramp. We were, we were having some fun. <laughs> that was fun. Good time. Good old and drift week, man. Like that. That's another thing. Like going into FD. I meant to mention that before. My chaser, you drove it today. We mm-hmm. had some fun. That car drives weird. It does. And I did not want to do... They th- all drive weird. Uh, there's, there's a lot of reasons why I'm not doing Drift Week, but one of them was spending two weeks in that car and then and getting my 15. Mm. Oh, my God. Yeah. It is... And it, because it's right-hand drive, your brain, like, makes you think that it would feel the same, but so I different. Know. And then you have... It t- if it, even if it just takes one or two more laps to get used to it because of that, it's mm-hmm. almost not even worth it for how much effort FD takes. So going back to Chelsea, she yep. does quite a bit behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She does. Yeah, so she, man, she's like my scheduler of my life. Like, literally, I will go to my calendar and be like, do I have anything going on tomorrow? And I look, and I'm like, oh, I have so much going on tomorrow. I'm really thankful that she fills all this in, you know, and makes it makes it work. And um, she's basically full-time hustler for me, you know, whether she's painting cars or fixing stuff or helping me flip cars. She's on the Internet finding cars to buy, and, you know, she's got a million cars of her own that I end up working on. <laughs> but yeah, she's really like the glue of my life for sure. It's wild. I never like it just happened to like she's like you're really you really need help with this. Like you are nuts like flying around everywhere doing everything and like rebooking flights because you missed an email cuz the event got changed and like all last minute all sorts of stuff and I'm like yeah, I'm like because I'm in the shop working and like so busy and then when I go into the house I just want to go to sleep like I'm exhausted, you know. So she kind of manages all that stuff and has been working out really good. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. And she travels everywhere, too. She even shoots a lot of my YouTube stuff. So I mean, she found me some Blitz. She, she did. She usually sends me the deals. She does. She's so good at that. It's yeah. wild. That's yeah, funny. it's funny. So a uh, question going with that is uh, I know we've had quite a few conversations before because, you know, through my past relationships and stuff, and uh, now I'm super thankful to be with someone like Colette who is in kind of what you're explaining very similar uh, to Chelsea and that she does a lot behind the scenes and she helps kind of ground me so much in that ways. But I'm curious from your experiences, like, you know, I feel like working with your significant other is often a taboo thing or something. A lot of people are like, Oh, don't do it or this or that. And, um, to kind of touch on the subject is, is it rad? Can it cause tension sometimes? No, I think so. Like we have a kind of a different relationship, you know, we're both kind of like pretty aggressive, wild people with stuff, you know? And like, we have no problem telling each other how we feel, right? So it's always like there's never a question if one's upset at another person or whatnot. So usually, like, we just, you know, go along with our life, and I quickly realize, like, oh, she doesn't enjoy this. You know, like, this is something that she's not enjoying that she's having to help me with or whatever. And I'm like, okay, so you just don't have to do that anymore. You know, it's, like, done. Like, we're not going to argue about it because, like, our relationship is more important than mostly any of that. So for if she's doing something she doesn't want to do, cars, you know, scheduling, you know, school of drift stuff or whatever, it's like, well, we'll just I'll handle that. You pick up the load somewhere else. And I think being brutally honest to the point where it's like almost ridiculous is the the key to it. I don't really see any negatives. I mean, sometimes it gets stressful, you know, but also like if someone's there to help you through all that stress and like it's 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 really like that's a necessity almost, I feel like. And having someone that you can vent to is like <sighs> yeah. huge, especially when like 
you probably can't vent to a lot of your friends because your friends might be what you need to vent about. Right, right, right. Because right. <laughs> they can get that way when you've got, you know, friends and employees around yeah. you all the time. You just need someone to talk to. Yeah, or sometimes you're upset about something that's really, it's stupid, but it's like affecting you so much, right? And you like, mad. you just want to be mad about it. Yeah. And you're like, I don't even know why I'm mad, but this is stupid, this is stupid. And then I'm like, okay, cool, <laughs> thanks. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's cool. I mean, honestly, like, I, I was never going to get married in my life. I was like, it's getting married, stupid. <laughs> and then I was like, damn, I'm not going to be with anyone else. This is it. Like, I'm just going to, why not? Let's get married. Screw it. So it worked out well. That's sick. Well, congrats, man. Yeah, appreciate it. So I've got a, I, I've got a question for you. I am someone who doesn't listen to any podcasts. Mm, I've never in my life. You, you also? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's funny. I've listened to, like, some Maximum Drift casts and other podcasts that I've been on, but I was going to ask you how I'm doing as a podcast. Uh, I don't know. I always feel like the best ones are just these, like, conversations back and forth because I feel like it's natural and there's no, like, oh, we have to talk about these points or whatever. Like, it just kind of just, you know, drives around all over the place in conversation. Yeah. I'm just tr- – I've, I've, like, kind of tried to steer the conversation yeah. in a way around – because I, I know a lot of the business side and like that's probably just as if not more inspiring to me of your journey than just your driving ability. Um, and a lot of the people I've looked up to throughout the years, Alfredo Mancuso is a big person in the BMX scene because mm-hmm. he was making business moves behind the scenes and driving a it. E92 M3 and like I How looked at... doing that? Yeah, like, yeah, it was just... That's, I looked up to the people that were really making something out of what they're doing, what they're doing and what their passion is because it, it's so difficult and you know, it, it's cool to kind of hear some of the the things that got you to where you are. Is there, is there anything that I like kind of may have missed that you're like any tips that you could give someone that wants to get their foot in the door in the automotive world or just be successful? And yeah, I don't know. It's it's just never going to be easy. Like you can't ever think that like anything, any of these successful people in this motorsport or motorsports in general have done, unless they're just like a a shoe that comes and drives and pays like anybody, whether they're a crew member whether they're a marketing guy or a driver or an announcer or like any of that, you could pick any of those people and those people that are successful in that are the people that like just live it and they want it. And no matter what it takes, they're going to make sure that every relationship they have is the best it can be. They're going to make sure that if they upset somebody or piss somebody off that they, you know, Hey, like what, what's going on? I'm sorry about that. Miscommunication this and that like everything that they do is like, it's not like, ah, screw it. Like, there's, you can't ever do that. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? You got to just always be like on top of it. And I think that's the biggest thing. Like it doesn't even apply. It's not even just motorsports. I feel like it's anything. It's like if we wanted to go do something tomorrow that was 100% unrelated to what we want to do and we took like our process, it would work. Yep. Like it would just work. We just got to put the focus towards it. You're going to learn. You're going to lose. You're going to win. You're going to blow it. You're going to suck at it or you're going to be great at it. And it's all going to work out in the end if you keep pushing. Kind of going hand in hand with that, like one of the things that was driven to me um, as an entrepreneur student at UCF was starting lean and in that like putting very little money and energy into something to figure out if it works and failing as fast as you can. Mm -hmm. So (laughs) the sooner you figure out that it's not going to work, the sooner that you can bounce back and learn from it or you can pivot and do something else. For sure. Where a lot of these people will, you know, save up forever for an idea and like think dump like, it oh. all into one. Yep. And they'll be like, oh, well, you know, I, I want to wait to try it until I do this, this and this and this and this, this. But there's going to be someone next to them that just tries it with very little and is figuring out and learning while they're just putting it off. I mean, that even kind of comes with the diversifying of everything. It's yep. like I... Like, I, I don't pull a lot of money in a hole, but I, like, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit there, and, like, a little bit of time, a little bit of effort, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And, like, hey, like, you know, people that are successful in that, then you kind of talk to them, and they're like, hey, like, yeah, it's, this is not really worth it unless you're doing this or that. And then you kind of decide, like, oh, that's not really where I wanted to go. Small investment, small investment of time. Got to just let it roll into something else that makes sense, you know? Yeah. Damn. Well, We've uh, we've had a long day, and I'm, a long day. I'm guessing these podcasts probably won't go up for a few weeks. But if you guys haven't seen the the video that we filmed at the compound, I've had Chelsea here pretty much <laughs> all day, and we've been drifting cars, catching them on fire, shooting paintballs. Man, it sounds way more exciting. Yeah, when no, I it's so, so dude. I had a blast <laughs> today. That's the best part is like sharing that with people, dude. Yeah. Like I know this is like you sharing it with me, right? You're mm-hmm. giving me a window into your compound here and your life and all that, and I'm just like having a blast right and it's just that's like 
that doesn't just necessarily happen all the time, you know, like being able to do those types of things, like drifting, we were talking about like taking those opportunities, like, you know, I would have not been to like half the countries I've been to half the things I've done if I wasn't just hungry, you know, like, Oh, we want you to come drive and whatever country. And you're like, okay, don't have to pay me. I just want to go and experience it. Like, even though like, guys would normally get paid for that or something. You and, know, then, like and then you make connections from that. that yeah, that make it worth it. Or if you way. don't, you had a great experience. Like, it, like it's all about experience, you know? That's it. Like, today was awesome. I really appreciate it. Of course. So I was going to close up here, but I have one more question for you. Okay. This is like my kind of like, I'm, I'm trying to absorb as much information as I can from you, and I'm also trying to learn for myself, not just share with other people. Sorry. Um, <laughs> managing relationships. You were talking about kind of like, you know, maintaining these relationships as you meet people and like really trying for me, that's a huge struggle because we meet so many people, whether it be mm. sponsors, friends, uh, acquaintances. It's it's a huge job to be able to maintain. Is that something you find yourself good at, bad at? Like, I'm really bad at names, mm-hmm. but I'm really good at like tying things together. Like when I'm talking to someone, like if I am like, oh, like I know this person, context clues, I'll just be like, hey, like you know, ask them a question about like to justify who they are like and then mm. I'm like oh I know who they are and then I'm like okay cool and we talk about it and stuff like or sometimes like I'm like yo I'm so sorry but like I just don't remember like how we met can you like remind me how we met and like no matter what at that point you're gonna remember like if somebody says something specific at least I feel like I do and like I'm like yo I'm really sorry but like I want to be a part of this conversation and I feel like it's one way right now because I don't I can't relate and I don't know what you're talking about like I don't know who you are and then they'll be like don't you remember you stayed at my house for a month? <laughs> and yeah. Like, oh yeah, oh my gosh. Like, and then go from there, you know, it's hard. Like I, like you said, you probably meet more people even than I do. And they always look different too. Like it'll be someone yeah. that, you know, I met maybe four years ago from BMX and they'll have like a beard now yeah. and they'll be three feet taller. Or like they worked for one tire company and then they're in another one. And I'm like, I feel like this is the guy that worked for so-and-so. <laughs> and I'm like, but it, like, I don't know. And then I'm like, did, and you'll say like, did you used to work for another tire company? And they're like, yeah, I used to work for something. Like, oh, okay. Now I know. But like, you know, so many faces, so many, you know, what they're wearing, like styles, even change it. Cars. Like how many people are in your phone right now by the car that they have? Actually, I think one. And it was Only the one? Con- dude, but here's Dang, the thing. I don't, good. I don't add people's contacts. <laughs> so right. I never know who anyone is. I have right. to like search keywords. I'm terrible at texting people back. Mm. I just, I'm a lot of times I'll like get a text from someone. I'll be like, Oh my God. Like I want to write a really long response. I don't have time to do it right now. I'll like be like, I'll do it later tonight. Mm -hmm. And then I'll like get home and suddenly go to sleep. And then I'll get a text like three months later from that person. Like, wow, they probably hate me now. Yeah. And then you see that it's like, they text you twice in a row. I know. And you're like, Oh my gosh. I meant, and then you just got to call them or text them back. Be like, yo, my bad. Like, I feel like an asshole. Yeah, that happens all the time. Okay, I'm glad I'm not the only one. That That's what I was getting at. I didn't know. Some people, like I've met some people in my life that are so good at managing relationships. Like I'll get a text from them every holiday. Like mm. I'm thinking about you. I'm hoping you're doing good. Yeah, and it just, make, it just makes me feel dead inside. It does. <laughs> I feel awful. But it's, like I said, it's like a balance. Like we could be good at that or I could be good at remembering like all these things that are a key part of my life to continue my track and what I'm doing. Agreed. Right? So it's like, I do feel bad. And, like, if I can make that up to you however I can, great. Mm-hmm. But, like, also, like, you're like, I just remembered my wife's phone number, like, three weeks ago for the first time. Do you know how I did that? No. I started using it at Walgreens. <laughs> I just made her an account. So I would have to type it in all the time when I'm running in and grabbing stuff. So I just remember her phone number. She gets so mad. We're married, everything. I wouldn't remember her phone number. I'm like, but if I remember your phone number, that means there's – those amount of digits that are out of my brain forever. <laughs> like I'm at full capacity already. I'm sure that works with her. Yeah, she's fine with it. Yeah. <laughs> but she'll bust my chops every time. What's my phone number? Uh, well, now you know it. So now I know it. So it's good. Cool. But, but yeah, it's the same thing. Like it's like, it's that in order to be successful, you have to prioritize things. I feel like. Yep. And unfortunately, my wife's phone number was not on the prior. Well, anyway, I uh, I appreciate you being the uh, the very first guest on this podcast here. Um, I hope it's been a pleasant experience, and you've you've set the bar very high with your stories. Oh, I don't so. know about that, but I feel like anybody who's on this show is going to be so nervous to sit across from you. Nah, bro, I'm going to be more nervous, man, dude. I'm always so nervous. I don't know why. It's just me, dude. Yeah, but I'm, I I haven't been nervous today at all. Mm, that's a lie. Maybe maybe when Cody was here. Earlier, you were like, I'm nervous. No, I just, so here's the thing. If you say you're nervous out loud. Then you're not nervous anymore. Yeah, exactly. Like I'm. That means you were nervous when you said it. Mm, 
maybe like a little. Yeah, ang- r- 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 I just I just <laughs> tried to start the video and like make it funny right off yeah, the bat. There's yeah, no yeah. if we started off trying to be like some polished production, then it would have it would have been rough. Where I started off stuttering and the it biggest would thing is not talking about it before you do it. What do you mean? Just when you shoot something, it's just like, oh, the game plan is we're gonna do this today, and this is the plan. That's it, and then we're not talking about it until we do it. Yeah, but then that makes Mike's job harder. I tr- I try to like well, he can figure it out. He's good at his job. I know, but we've been dude. We're so remember when you wouldn't hire anybody to help you? <laughs> How about let's talk about that. I'll ask you the question. Uh, you can ask me some questions about that. I was like, dude, we we you came and drove a demo with us, mm-hmm. and like I had some YouTube questions. We were talking and we were like chatting about it, and I'm like, why are you still editing all of your stuff and doing all of that? And you were like, well, because there's no one else that can do it. And I was like, remember I told you the eighty percent rule. Oh yeah, remember that? Mm-hmm. I was like, if you hire someone, and they can do eighty percent of what you like, like you like eighty percent of it, it's like that's a win. For me, the the editing thing was always just, I would either like I hate sending footage. There's so many times where I wouldn't have internet that most of the time everything's so real time that it would be physically impossible for me to send the footage, have it done in time. I'd have for to sure. review it, and at that point, my videos are so chopped up that it's easier for me to just do it myself. For sure, but but how much better is it with him? Well, having Mike. He's around all the time, so it's different. I'm not sending footage. And yeah. It, it literally took having him on trial, basically on Drift Week, to see if I could stand him for three weeks in a car. Yeah. And, like, we got along super well. He's probably one of my best friends right now, and uh, it's been awesome having him around. And I feel like it's it's taken so much off my shoulders that any any sort of success in the past year and a half, like, I can hugely attribute it to that because I've, I've finally been able to step outside of yeah. working in my business and start working on it. And it's something I knew I needed to do forever. Like everyone would always tell me, we were like, just do it. You just don't believe in you it. You don't just hire someone for that. Like no, you need to. For sure. Not. And do you, do you find like the right people usually end up just coming and just like presenting themselves? Uh, sometimes. Yeah. I feel like that's like every great person in my life. It just, they just pop up like right, right when they need <laughs> to like almost every single time. Let me get your silver spoon out of your mouth real quick. What does that mean? No, I'm just saying like you were just like every time I need something it just pops up. It's amazing. <laughs> no, not like that, but like I I feel like if I look for someone No, I know what you mean. It's not good, right? You just got to let it let it come naturally. I agree. But I just was like, man, he's going to come hang out with us. We're going to go to dinner. We're going to do all this and the whole time you I'm at dinner I'm watching you and you're like thinking about the time and how much more you had to do that night editing yeah. and putting out a video and I'm like that's cool and like I think that that's part of it. But I also think that, like, once you've created a brand and created all that and everything that you have, like, you can't do that anymore. Like, it's like, you can when you need to with mm-hmm. stuff. But, like, also it's about training someone to be able to lighten the load. I mean, I, w- I wouldn't have time to be doing this with you right now. And right, because you'd I'm, be editing. I'm excited He's for this. He's actually editing right now this whole time. No, I'm, I'm, edi- I'm editing in my brain. I'm, like, texting Mike. I'm, like, Mike, put this clip in here, put this here. No. <laughs> but, no, you're right, man. And, you know, I, I learned about, I learned that kind of the, uh, again, the right person like James, who you've met, who is my yep. right hand man, who runs so much behind the scenes. Like, he was a friend of mine that did like one or two digital like graphics for me back in the day. And I I went home for the summer, and he was going to ship out orders out of his garage, and he ended up just keeping all my merch there, and just I relinquished control from there. But before that, I was editing, filming every single day, going to school full time, doing homework, shipping, shipping out orders, and like you need to to get to the point like. You're gonna need those long nights, and you're gonna need to for sure. be guzzling down well, gallons of coffee. You're still doing the same thing. It's just you're growing yourself instead. Like we're doing this podcast, which maybe will c- be something great. Maybe it won't. We're investing some time and effort mm-hmm. into it, and if it's great, it's great. If it's not, it's not. Um, but like you wouldn't be able to diversify and do that if you were still editing and doing all that stuff. No, hundred so percent. It's like it's hard. It's hard to let go though, too. Yeah, it is because <laughs> it's like this is my baby. My whole life to yep. everything. Don't blow it. And they're like, uh, it's so hard. Well, I'll okay. Let's actually go. We're almost at an hour. We no, I, I, kept, I kept I kept looking at that, and I was like, should I try dragging this conversation up for an hour? We're or? at fifty eight and change because you're probably mm. going to cut out the first minute. So oh, you're being here, super here, nervous. Here I get a thing. So, give me a a sixty. Not it doesn't even be sixty seconds. Thirty seconds. No, you I'm were gonna say no. What? Do you even know where I'm, I'm going? I'm gonna say no. Because you were literally doing it before I hit record. Yep, I already know. I'm gonna say no. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm too vulgar when I freestyle, so I'm gonna not do that. I mean, we've got swears in here, dude. It's yeah, not. It's all good, bro. It's rated M <laughs> for mature. Nah, I'm gonna keep that. There's some videos flo- <coughs> floating around of me freestyling. Is there? 
I'm well, losing well, my voice right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. That's his excuse. So there's like this <coughs> gnarly, gnarly dirt that gets kicked up by the cement here. Yeah. And it makes you. <laughs> it just came out just now. Yeah, I, I was wondering <laughs> how you weren't coughing before. It's the the way they equate it to people. If you've ever been to Warp Tour in a gravel parking lot, and like when you get home and you're like blowing your or nose, or if you work in construction, and it's like black, and you're like yeah. hucking up dust and Dude, chalk. This is really bad right now. Yep. <laughs> mm. <laughs> All right, we're going to cut this. We got we got to go 30 more seconds. Let me think if I can ask you a question. Of all your cars, which makes the best emotion to drive? Best emotion. Doesn't matter if it's bad or good or like I mean bad at driving or whatever. Like what's your most in the feels car that you have? Ooh, I would man, it's it's tough. It's tough because every car is kind of like evolved and like mm-hmm. at one point it was very in my feels of like my Evo driving through Connecticut. Same thing with my GT3, but I, I feel like one that's kind of stood the longest for that was probably the 13 because that mm-hmm. thing like you drove it today it had me in my field you drove today. it hard dude that's a good sr it's a good sr there's not bad ones no but like they're all good it's just whoever tunes them <laughs> sounds great like it's spicy the mid-range it is. is there it, oh, is. it just feels good it's emotional it's mm-hmm. good i like that all right we've officially hit an hour let's do it and this thank you chelsea Fine. i also wanted to plug your podcast mm. i don't know if you'll have yours going by the time that this goes out <laughs> maybe but we're I don't doing know if you want to share a little bit. Yeah, about we're that. just going to do a podcast based around chassis setup and sustainability of drifting. I think that there's a lot to learn with that stuff. And I want to be able to offer that to people that want it. Mm-hmm. Um, so basically, it'll just be, you know, talking about chassis setup probably two a week and talking about how much how easy it is to over two a week. Yeah, that's a lot. to You're setting the bar high. I think that's the way to go. I think I think I wanted to average like six a month. OK, that's that's yeah. reasonable. Um, I was just going to try to shoot them all at one time. <laughs> like, That's not a bad idea. And then put them out when I had time. But, yeah, I mean, I think that there's a big lack of that out there, and there's a lot of information that's skew. And a lot of people just buying and building cars, that, like picking random things that they want. And I think there's a lot of money wasted in people, and it, I think they're getting burnt out of drifting because they spend a lot of money on all the wrong things, and they don't get to have the feels and the emotion of drifting in time. Agreed. You know? So I think... I mainly am doing it literally just to sustain drifting and make it better. Like that's been my goal with the school and all that stuff. That's really cool. And and just to preface, this podcast is not planned to really be a drift podcast. And I, ironically, I almost didn't want to start with you because I knew we'd go on tangents about drifting. But most yeah. of the people that I want to bring on like aren't necessarily drifters. Maybe you're in the drifting world, but just have really cool stories of how they got to where they are in the automotive world. For sure. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you, Chelsea. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening for an hour of us blabbering. Yep. <laughs> I appreciate it, guys. Um, there will be. You didn't even use a soundboard. Oh, you didn't even say a joke. Or is that the joke? That didn't was even the use joke. Okay. I just used I it. Uh, next week, new. Am I doing monthly? Weekly? Yeah, next week, new podcast. I'm doing weekly. I yeah, decided just, just now. It? Yep. Did I? Oh, man. Oh, gosh. That's well, a lot. Well, you said two a week. One a week is way more. Well, yeah, I figured two some weeks. Okay, we're done here. Thank Goodbye. you. Bye.